because it's Pride Month. Let's talk film. Hi, my name's Lauren and I'm a film student who wants to share what I'm passionate about with you. As the name indicates, this is a weekly series, so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future videos. Today, I'll be giving a very broad overview of the new queer cinema movement. I researched this for my Race and Diversity class this past spring at Temple, and I was interested in it because, first of all, obviously I love movies, I love film. I'm also a member of the LGBTQ plus community, so I just thought it'd be a great integration for my own personal interests for class. And then I thought, as for this Film Friday, because it is Pride Month, that this would be the perfect topic to share with you guys. This one may be a little bit more research heavy in the sense that I'll be referencing specific quotes from some texts that I will link in the description down below. So if that may not be your cup of tea, then you may not want to watch this video, but come back next Friday for a more regularly scheduled program. I'm going to look down in a second because I don't want to mess with this definition, but for the purpose of this video, queer is defined as such. According to Mental Barber, queer appropriates the derogatory term but also opens up identity categories, such as gay and lesbian, to include the range of non-normative sexual desires and behaviors. Queer allows activists, theorists, and filmmakers to expand the range of identities to include bisexual, transsexual, intersex, SM, and transgender. Okay, now that that is out of the way for this video, let's just get right into it. So what is the new queer cinema movement? The new queer cinema movement emerged in the 1990s and really brought about a lot more visibility to the LGBTQ plus community. It describes the radical and highly aestheticized films that often portrayed queers in the margin of past and contemporary societies and paved the way for the presence of gays and lesbians in conventional films, according to Mel Barber. This movement brought in about a new way of looking at how queer people fit into a heteronormative society because that really is what our society has been and in many ways really still is. So we've discovered that the new queer cinema movement started in the 90s, but queerness existed in cinema before that. So if we wanna trace queerness in cinema, we really wanna start in the 20s in Germany's Weimar Republic because Berlin was really a hot spot of queer culture. Then from the late 1940s to the early 1970s, Queerness started to become an unspoken kind of presence in the Hollywood studio system, but it wasn't until the 80s and the 90s that the queer stars were really coming out of the closet and away from camp. From the 1970s to the 1980s, more B films were really rising, showing things like nudity, STDs, drugs, etc. And it was those films that helped link high art, experimental, camp, into what would become the new queer cinema movement films. For our first case study film, we're gonna be talking about Nosferatu by F.W. Murnau from 1922. This film is obviously German. From the surface, you may not think that there's anything necessarily queer about it in the sense that it's about a vampire. It's not about like a couple, a any kind of queer couple. However, according to Mental Barber, Nosferatu exudes an eroticism that is non-normative, non-procreative, bisexual, and lethal. Because think about it, Nosferatu does take blood from both men and women. However, as was often the case with these early films, even if there were some non-heteronormative subtexts going on in the films, it always has a heteronormative ending. In this case, it takes a woman to kill Nosferatu. That being said, the film also does just give a sense of belonging to an undefined queerness and deviant nature. Deviant in the sense that it goes against what society entails versus deviant as in like a criminal or against the law. And just as a little shout out to F.W. Murnau, he was really inspirational because he was an openly gay man in both Berlin and Hollywood after he moved. Good for him. So then jumping from 1922 to 1948, we have Alfred Hitchcock's Rope, which according to Mel Barber, again, my favorite man, Rope discredits homosexuality by connecting it to a violent death, an association that is common in films that employ this kind of subtext for spectator spectatorial pleasure. I'm now going to read a little bit of the script and then explain it. No spoilers here, by the way, about 
the fact that these two boys are murdering someone with a rope, that's literally the opening scene. Brandon, how did you feel? When? During it. I don't know, really. I don't remember feeling very much of anything until his body went limp and I knew it was over. And then? Then I felt tremendously exhilarated. How did you feel? Oh, I, I, <laughs> take my bow now. So as you may or may not be evident from this, which I will not explain, there is the homoerotic subtext here as the discussion they are having could also come after having some kind of sexual activity or relations between the two of them. That's all I'm gonna say about it on the subject for now. So, okay, so we just talked about the late 40s, but how did the movement really evolve um, from the 70s to the 80s and the 90s when it really exploded and even sort of beyond? So really the key thing about this movement was that it was not just related to film. So obviously here we're focusing on the new queer cinema movement, but there was also just a general movement forming and it was tied to many other art forms, politics, activism, queer theory, and so much more. But to focus back in a little bit back to the cinema, one thing that was just really important about this movement in particular was that instead of these coming out stories and tales of the tragic queers and homosexuals that are intended to solicit, as Mel Barber puts it, tolerance, characters in the new queer cinema movement were all sorts of people, kings, poets, as men horses, hustlers, and murderers. But they were really just unapologetically themselves as they expressed their desires that were deemed deviant by, the, by outside society. And they could just engage in what they wanted in their queer sexual practices as, as he put it in rough and gritty images. They didn't have to be rough and gritty images, but some of those images were, maybe those were in some of the B films or just the ones that were kind of up and coming. But it was just this way of just expressing themselves in a way that was not allowed at all prior. One sentence that I thought was just really moving is about the film Go Fish from 1994. And it is this. Go Fish tells a simple tale. Girl meets girl, girl falls in love with girl, girl gets girl. It's really simple, really basic. There's nothing crazy going on there. It's just a love story. And the crazy thing is, it's just about two girls. It doesn't matter if it was about two boys, a boy and a girl, or any non-gender conforming or gender fluid person in there. It's just about two people who fall in love, and that is the power of this movement. Now, at the end of the 90s, we have But I'm a Cheerleader from 1999. I think this movie, personally, is great. Very funny, really fun and fresh. This is definitely the end of like the campy films that most films were really coming away from, and the long line really says it all. <clears throat> a naive teenager is sent to rehab camp when her straight-laced parents and friends suspect her of being a lesbian. And just really the great part about this film is that it showed a whole camp of people who were all in the same place as Megan. As people who aren't really sure, some of them are questioning their identity, some people have decided to accept it, and then as they like break free from these bonds and really just are happy with themselves and who they are and who they are attracted to and love. And it's just a really powerful film. Then in 2005, kind of on the edge of the movement really, we have the much more serious film, Brokeback Mountain. And this film I watched recently just really for this presentation, but I really did enjoy it. And once again, from Mental Barber, I did also read Be Ruby Rich, but I only have one quote of his that I'm saving for the end for this video. And that is, this film offers a public discourse about the self-understanding of the American nation and masculinity by rewriting the conventions of the Western. Often when we think of a Western film, we think of the cowboy taking over everything, really exuding this, like overly confident, they get all the girls and they maybe come home to a woman, but maybe they have many other women on the side, you can't really know. But they're just like taking charge of the horse and it's just this idea that they're a man in charge of everything. Woohoo, yeah, men. And this film really shows two men who offer different sides of masculinity. There's not just one way to be a cowboy. It's not just one way to be a man. I think that's really important. Really, it's quite sad as these two men who love each other, but they have to keep really rejecting each other because the world that they live in doesn't accept them. And it does take place in the past. It's not a film that takes place in 2005, but I think what's really, at least what really struck with me is that in a lot of places, it's still like that. There's not really so much acceptance everywhere about um, any kind of LGBTQ plus relationship identity and to me that was just like what really stood out to me about this film. And also you don't, I just don't hear or see that many films about two men. I feel like 
and it might be because I'm a woman, so maybe if I'm gonna watch like a queer film, I'm gonna watch one about women, I don't know. But I thought this was really great. And it was really just like, also, like I talked about with the Go Fish, really just about a love story, a universal love story of like star-crossed lovers, you know? It doesn't matter what gender they are. So you might be thinking, okay, Lauren, but now it's 2020, that was from 2005, like where did the movie go from there? Sort of, it may have gone into the new, new queer cinema movement. Now, a great film example of this is one of my favorite movies ever. Shout out to my friend, Sylvia, who introduced this to me. And this is Carol by Todd Haynes from 2015. This film is another movie about a couple who is not really necessarily supposed to be together in society's eyes, but what really separates this film from Brokeback Mountain and other tragic tales is that this film, according to feminist staying here, betrays the tragic expectation of a lesbian mother forced to pretend to love her husband by giving these women the strength and intelligence to undermine the misogyny that comes their way. Yes, women take down the patriarchy. This film, unlike The Danish Girl, which is also a great film, really gives women these women agency in the Danish girl Lily dies for her gender identity, but in Carol, Carol and Therese are able to be together at the end and love each other and live their lives. It may not be the perfect happy life that maybe people who fit into what society molds as acceptable may have, but it's really a step forward. And just another side note, Todd Haynes was really heavily influenced by the new queer cinema movement in France. And he made earlier film Poison in the 90s that was a precursor to Carol, but I have not seen that film. Really, just to sum it up, this movement expanded diversity in Hollywood, and even though it is a slow war, every film that comes out that adds to the body of work is another battle won, and eventually you just won't be able to ignore the legacy and the foundation that is in place from the new queer cinema movement. And to end with a great quote by B. Ruby Rich, <clears throat> Queer is hot. And that wraps up this video. If you learned something, be sure to give it a nice thumbs up. Please leave any comments down below. If you have feedback, questions, suggestions, literally anything. And remember to subscribe also down below so that you don't miss my regular Wednesday videos or the next Film Friday. And I will see you next time. Bye!